First one I have comes from a sister in San Antonio. And I thought it was a... I almost said a fun question, but we shouldn't like that word, right? John Piper hates that word. But it's a cheap word. It's a shallow word. Anyways, I, I mean, I think it's a good question. We should be asking questions. And here it is. Good morning, Brother Tim. Here you go. I have a question. I found a passage that's puzzling me. And I've read this book many times before and never noticed this verse. So that's interesting because this sister has been a Christian a long time. And so she's read the book of Mark. That's where the question comes from. She says, I've read this book many times. And she's never noticed something. I was reading today out of Deuteronomy, and I noticed something that I had never seen before, which shocks me. Like, I, it surprises me when I see things in Scripture, and I think, either I'm losing my memory, and I did see it before, but now I've forgotten, or I just never remember seeing the verse I saw today. But anyway, that's what happened to her. I don't know how and why. It belongs here, the verse that she just noticed for the first time. She noticed it, and it jumped out at her as, why is it even there? Well, the verses in Mark that she's referring to are Mark 14, 51, and 52, I guess, directly refer Okay, I'm going to I'm going to read this in context. This is Mark 14:43. If you have your Bibles, you can look there. Mark 14:43. And immediately while Jesus was still speaking. Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. Now here's, here's what the sister is referring to. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him. And he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. And they led Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. So you see, you see verses 51 and 52. A young man followed him, with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. And <clears throat> the verse that I didn't feel like I had seen before out of Deuteronomy um, wasn't, it didn't jump out at you like this does. What do you make of that? What do you make of those two verses? Anyways, there she asked, who was this young man, and what is the significance of this verse right here? What does it portray? Well, it's almost like when you ask, what does it portray? It's, it's almost like that's asking the question, well, like, is it a sign of something, or does it have some hidden meaning? Or, I think it portrays what it is. 
I, I mean, it's a narrative, it's an account, it's historical, it's a fact, it happened, and what's significant about it is it's not found in any of the other Gospels. It's not found anywhere else. And so, that makes it unique. And uh, what do you think? Anything jump? I mean, think, just, just as we're thinking about Scripture, a young man followed him. So, I mean, what would jump out at me is that, notice verse 50, they all left him and fled. Who's that? The disciples. And notice the, but notice the contrast. A young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him. They didn't seize the disciples because the disciples fled. In fact, if we compare the accounts, Jesus actually, he actually speaks in their behalf. Like, let them go. You want me, let them go. He basically says. But what's interesting is they ran. This guy didn't run yet. This guy stayed with Christ until they grabbed him. And he's a young man. There's nothing here about he's Thomas or he's the youngest of the disciples. Every indication here is that the disciples ran. This was not one of the eleven. We know Judas has shown himself the betrayer now. But there's no indication that this is one of the eleven. This is somebody else. And he's young. And notice this. With nothing but a linen cloth about his body. Now, in fact, in fact, nothing but a linen cloth that's just wrapped around him so that when they grab him, it comes right off. And so, why is he out there without his clothes on with just like a sheet wrapped around him? Well, you might surmise, I mean, this is, this is nighttime. You might surmise that the guy had been in bed. Where were they? They were at Gethsemane. They had left the upper room. They were in Gethsemane. Now, I don't know how you imagine that, but people could have lived close by there. There was obviously commotion. There's swords flying. Somebody's ear got cut off. All the people fell down in John's account. There's, there's, a, there's a crowd. There's a rabble out there. These guys came with clubs and torches, and, and so something's going on. Where did this guy come from? Maybe he came from bed, honestly. Maybe he lived right there. Maybe Gethsemane was actually his garden. Who knows? But I mean, if, if, we're, just, if we're just asking questions of the text, I mean, you, you have to ask, guys don't typically just walk around naked except with the linen cloth. But he left the linen cloth why? Because they seized him. So, they, so the very fact that he was following Christ, they grabbed him. Which is interesting. Why do you suppose they grabbed him? Yeah, because however he was standing there in the crowd, he wasn't, he wasn't just looking like he was... A casual observer. Like they didn't look at him and say, well, that guy, he doesn't have anything to do with this thing. And they didn't look at him and say, oh, he's one of us. They looked at him and undoubtedly they identified him with Christ some way. There, there must have been something about where he stood or what his action was. You know what? You can almost imagine the crowd came. They're all facing Christ and his disciples. 
Christ and his disciples are facing them. Peter pulls out a sword, hacks a guy's ear off. I mean, when Jesus said, I am, they all fell down. Well, not his disciples. So you got two crowds here, and undoubtedly these two crowds are facing off. You know what's interesting about this young man? The reason they would have seized him is undoubtedly because when all the other guys ran, there were still two guys facing the big crowd. There were still two guys in the smaller crowd, at least. I mean, we don't know if anybody else was there. No, nobody else has talked about. But this guy actually stayed around long enough, and he somehow postured himself so that apparently he identified with Christ. That's why they seized him. They obviously seized him. They weren't seizing their own people, and they wouldn't have seized casual observers. Somehow they identified him with Christ. I just... Yeah, it makes you wonder, okay, who is this guy? And you know what? If you look at commentators, it's like some of the commentators say, oh, they all the way back into ancient Christianity, the very first Christians, they all assumed this was Mark. Mark was a young man. This isn't in any of the other accounts. And some of the commentators say, yeah, historically, this, is, this has always been assumed to be Mark. But then you read somebody like Calvin, and he just mocks at that idea. He just laughs it off, like, like almost like some pathetic creatures out there actually even assume that this was Mark. Almost like, ha ha, like that's the most ignoramious state, statement that somebody could make. But um, you know what? I, I've always thought this is Mark, despite Calvin mocking me. Um, you know, John, John puts himself out there in his, in, in his gospel, the disciple that Jesus loved. And it's interesting that Luke, you know, Luke wrote Luke and Acts. And the interesting thing about both Luke and Acts is you can find pronouns in both Luke and Acts that refer to Luke. Like he identifies himself. There's some interesting things about Matthew to think about too, but that's not. But but here, this this incident only showing up in Mark. Some people have just basically kind of construed this as as a sort of signature, like he signed his letter by not by name, but just by giving this kind of ambiguous account. Because if you think about it, it's like, yeah, this is the sister asking. It's like, yeah, what is the significance? Why did that just pop in there? How come the other guys, they don't think... In, in fact, Mark is abbreviated. Mark is the shortest gospel. You know what that means? Mark passes over accounts that... Do you know? I, and I've done this before. I've gone verse by verse through Mark, and I've looked for everything in Mark that's specific only to Mark. And you know, there's not that much. There's not that much that's found only in Mark and not in Matthew and Luke. But this is one of the accounts. And I think that's always interesting when you have this author and he chose to record some things that none of the other three Gospels record for us. And this is one. And so this author, for some reason, this caught his attention. And the other guys, he just passed over it. Like, they didn't think it was significant. Like, isn't it? Think, think about the whole account. If you, if you had watched this, or you were some, somebody like Luke and you were gathering all the facts, and you heard that Jesus said, I am he, and bang, they all fell down. Would you have left that out? 
three of them left it out. If you saw Peter pull out a sword and chop off Malchus's ear and Jesus put it back on, would you have left that out of your account? Yet three of them did. You know, way back when I was a brand new Christian, I remember listening to John MacArthur, and he said, one of the reasons that, like the Gospels, are, if you were just looking for proof about the validity, he said, the economy of words itself testifies that it wasn't authored by men. And you know what that always jumped out of me? The economy of words. In other words, what he was pointing at is we tend to be exhaustive. If we were telling a story about an event where, one, there was a young man that basically got his clothes stripped off of him, who hung around with Christ right to the end, and he ran away naked, you'd say that. And if Jesus said, I am, and they all fell down, you'd say it. And if Jesus put somebody's ear back on, you would say it. And yet, all of those things, three of the authors of the, of the Gospels leave out. And, and MacArthur looked at that and he said, in his estimation, that, that truth right there, that fact about the Gospels, is, is very self-authenticating. And I agree with that. That just, just the shortness, the brevity of what the Spirit of God, it's like things that you and I would never leave out of a story, the Spirit of God inspired these guys to leave out. I think that we don't know for certain. We can just lay that down. It doesn't tell us who it is. But because it only shows up in Mark, is, is I, I mean, could are, are, are we taking this way out left field? Is this a real stretch for us to say, hey, yeah, maybe this is some kind of signature on this gospel. And you know what? From the early Christian times, yeah, they did think that this this indeed was the author himself. This was Mark, and and some have thought. I mean, let, let let's just let's think about Mark. What do we know about Mark? He traveled in with Paul and Barnabas, and then he left the work early. So much so was that kind of a failure, at least in Paul's eyes, that when they decided to go out again on his second missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas parted ways because Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, and Paul didn't. And the reason Paul didn't was because on the first missionary journey, Mark kind of abandoned them and went home, got rough, and he didn't stay the course. And so Barnabas took Mark, and then Paul took Silas. What else do we know about Mark? Do we know, do we know what his relationship to Barnabas was? Yeah, they were related. That might have had something to do with it. They were related. What do we know about Mark's mother? Do we know anything? Listen to this. Remember when Peter got let out of prison? When Herod had taken him, he planned to kill him. And the angel came and took him through the streets. And then all of a sudden, he thought he had seen a vision. And all of a sudden, he came to. When he realized that basically he was freed, 
He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and praying. Now, some have surmised, you know, when you go to the beginning of Mark's or of Acts, this, this is found in Acts, that they were praying at this house. In the beginning, we find that they're gathered together in an upper room, in a house, and they're praying. Some have surmised that that may have been the same house. And some have thought it's exactly the same house where the upper room discourse that I'm going through right now also took place. Um, some have thought that, that that home, that upper room, was basically where they met with Jesus and the early disciples continued to meet there and they had their prayer meeting there and being the house of John Mark. Well, for whatever that's worth. But um, John also is, um, he comes up in various places. Barnabas and Saul, this is Acts 12, 25. Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. In Acts 13, 5, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. In Acts 13, 13, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. In Acts 15, 37, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and, gone, and had not gone with them to the work. But there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. When we come to Colossians, it says this, Aristarchus, this is Colossians 4.10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And then in 2 Timothy, and what's significant about 2 Timothy is that this is at the end of Paul's ministry. So way back at the beginning, Paul didn't want to take Mark, but here at the end of Paul's life, it says 2 Timothy 4.9, Do your best to come to me soon, this is to Timothy, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Um, I don't know. We don't know exactly. But I'll tell you this. Mark... Did he have some weakness? Yep. Did he turn back? Yep. By the end of Paul's life, he's very valuable to Paul. And it, 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 if you look carefully, there are many reasons to believe that Mark actually penned his gospel under the tutelage of Peter. And there's reasons for thinking that. But anyways, Mark, John Mark was significant in the early church. And I can tell you this, is if, if as a young man, some young man stood with Christ. Now he still ran away when they seized him. But he stood there, I don't know, maybe it was just moments longer. I mean, maybe it would have been really commendable if the young man had gotten taken away with him and had stood by him all the way to the gallows. But he stood longer than the others. Anyway, I, I don't really have any other thoughts. People ask questions. You know, you can only a answer questions dogmatically when the Scripture tells us something dogmatic. And there's just kind of some speculation here. Any other thoughts on Mark? Asking this from the authorship. Um, I've heard people saying that about um, Mark being written under Peter's uh, influence. But what... Uh, I'm not saying I disagree, I've heard it and I, I thought it sounds right, but I don't have any evidence for it. I've just heard trusted people say that. What are your 
uh, everything since then? How, how's that? Um, well, if you think about the, um, I'm trying to think. I mean, when you when you take what we know is from Peter, and you, well, basically first and second Peter, and I'm thinking that there is some correlation there, and uh, yeah, I'm looking for it, it. It's pretty much been touted that way, and I can remember. Trying to remember. Um, I am drawing a blank. I don't know why I keep thinking about the sermon on the or or the uh, transfiguration and why that's jumping out at me, but there were certain there's certain aspects about. Peter's emphasis in the in his epistles. I mean, you know, one of the things that one of the ways that we can really see the authorship of, like, First John is First John, Second John, Third John. It so resonates with the Gospel of John, and if if you have the same man writing these letters then there's you're you're going to find some similarities and i i i am trying to go back in my mind and think i've spent there's been seasons where i've spent a good deal of time in mark and and in first and second peter and i remembered having the thought that yeah i can see why they might think that, and, uh, and I'm just drawing a blank as to some real. Anyways, you can research it, but it's uh, you know basically with no authorship. The fact is that the the Bible. It's this this it's just like the letters of scripture. Where did they come from? Well, I was watching some live stream from Asbury uh, on that revival taking place there, and I was looking at the comments, and some Catholic guy was saying that the Catholic Church that they're responsible for the Bible. No, they're not responsible for the Bible. Early church recognized many things. And you can understand this. You can understand that the disciples, those men that walked with Jesus, they spoke. They traveled all over the place. These guys were circuit riders. These guys were on the move. These guys were preaching and taking the gospel. There's reason to believe that they got scattered and they went out to the four corners of the earth. These men would have told the stories way beyond the detail we have in the Gospels. People would have had questions. They would have talked. The early church would have passed those stories around. The fact is that the early church recognized which letters had apostolic authenticity. And they recognized which letters the Spirit of God was using, which letters were consistent with, with the the message, the gospel. I mean, they, they, they could sniff out if there were irregularities or there was some kind of heresy, some, some kind of false doctrine. And so the early church put the stamp of approval on what came from the apostles, what was apostolic, what was, what was legitimate. And so the, the books of Scripture, yes, there was a council where finally the 66 books were identified, but that doesn't mean that they were responsible for them. No, hardly. For 300 and some odd years, 
the church had been recognizing those books already and had been living on them and passing them around and 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 giving copies and and uh so anyway the the point is this there there the early church had ideas about like this being mark or who the authors were i mean it's it's these things were handed down from generation to generation now you come to modern scholars they all question the modern scholars question everything. Um, you have the, the higher criticism. These, these guys, they, they, wanna, they call into question everything. All the authors, all the truths that you don't want to read these guys. Don't, don't, even, don't even go there. Well, for instance, if you simply go to the internet and you type in who wrote Mark, you're going to find all manner of questions. But it's not just that they question who wrote Mark, they question whether it's even scripture. And then they question the legitimacy of this and the legitimacy of that. And, and, They'll come up with something like, well, this, we don't even know that, that this could have been written by Paul, or we don't know that, uh, well, you got these, these chapters over here, and it seems like, it's kind of like somebody, who was it that threw out the other day, that, that the names of God in the first, what, three chapters or 11 chapters or whatever of Genesis, the names of God are different from the names used after that. So somebody comes right along and says, see, it's not the same author. If it was the same author, they'd be using the same terminology all the way through. Well, see, that's, that's, like, that's, that's ridiculous. And uh, you, you're going to find these scholars that are going to try to debunk everything. And... It, I remember one time I was trying to take some, some uh, I, I was trying to get seminary degree online, and it was great. As long as they, I studied Judges, loved it. Studied Mark, I loved it. I studied uh, First Thessalonians. Uh, there were four books, maybe Philippians. Anyways, I, I absolutely loved it. And then I got into higher criticism, and I shelved it, and I was done. And I used the books basically to hold up our bed, because that's the last thing that I want to do. Last thing I want to do is be studying guys that are calling into question everything. In terms of the uh, gospel, like writings and uh, scripture being recognized, I've heard a lot of the uh, church fathers. Reference them in the second century. They reference the scriptures in terms of like Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. And uh, in terms of dating, because I've heard like the, the sort of high criticism guys or the people who don't believe, they'll always try to push for a further dating. But um, something that I personally found encouraging in terms of uh, Acts being written, there was a place where there's a folk consul mentioned and he was in like the early 60s AD and then it basically gives evidence that Luke was written in the early 60s AD and then that that means sorry that Acts was written in the early 60s that means that Luke must have been a, a few years earlier so late 50s and then uh, he, told, he says that uh, just looking from scripture itself he says that uh, many have already written accounts of what had happened so that means that the other gospels were already earlier and things uh, it didn't really travel uh, as quickly as it does nowadays. Just just showing the fact that within maybe 20, 30 years, the Gospels were already around between the 20 and 30 years uh, from the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, just personally, I found it encouraging, just like even from Scripture itself, there's like solid uh, dating and things like that. In the end, the Spirit of God is going to convince us by faith that the Word of God, if we, the, the problem is this, if, if we ever get to the place where we have to depend on archaeological finds or some, some kind of proof outside the Bible, 
that's necessary. I mean, yes, I, I'm interested when they make these different discoveries. But the thing is that ultimately our faith doesn't rest in that. Our faith rests in the fact that all Scripture is God-breathed. And the early church, I mean, this, these letters were committed to the church. And it's been God's people that have uh, historically affirmed the validity of... Of course, we had the Old Testament handed down to us. You know, in the days of Jesus, Jesus came along. If there had been anything wrong with the Old Testament, Jesus could have said, oh, you don't have the right books. Or he would, none of that happened. And he prepared us for the writing of the New Testament. And he basically said when the Spirit came, this is what was going to be produced. God has promised to preserve his word until the end of time. Heaven and earth might pass away. But his word's not going to pass away. And so we know that we have God's preservation. And God has chose to preserve his word, the New Testament, basically by it being penned. We don't have the originals. So how can we be so certain about its authenticity? For this reason, because God promised to preserve it. And he used a human means that was the means most likely to have an interest in preserving it. Who? The people of God. The very people who would not want to see any error creep in, who would have wanted to preserve those apostolic letters and pass them around from church to church to church. And so we have to take that by faith that God did that. And so, yes, you're going to get early date, late date. You're going to get all sorts of stuff. And in the end, we have to embrace the scriptures and take it by faith. The truth is that whether Mark was written by Mark or not written by Mark, that, that doesn't affect the validity of it. The only reason Mark is tagged to that is because historically the church, it, it's just come down from the very ancient days that he was the author. We can't prove it from the inspired text itself, but Christianity is basically held to that. And so a lot of times, yes, what you're saying is what people have looked at. What did the early church fathers have to say? What did they write? If the early church fathers are quoting from different Bible uh, books, then that, that gives us, at least it gives us the idea that Yes, the early church had these books. They were using these books. But even then, if we get something from like the Shepherd of Hermes or we get something that possibly from Ignatius or Polycarp or something, the fact is God never promised to preserve it. And anything that the Catholics have put their hands to, beware. They will alter, change, totally rewrite. They, they I mean, it's satanic. They don't want to preserve the truth. They, they, uh, and, and God never promised to preserve these things. So we just have to be careful that just because uh, something was preserved from Clement or whatever. I, I know that there are these supposed ancient letters, but authenticity is often difficult to establish. And then even if you can, it doesn't mean that the author was right. Even though these early church fathers wrote certain things, they're not under inspiration. And so perhaps even when they initially wrote, maybe they were wrong sometimes. So we really have to be careful. We don't want to equate any of the early fathers with Scripture itself.